Uh, good morning and welcome to the Communication Signal Processing Seminar. I should first thank the research areas for supporting this, uh, both NCIS as an SP. So uh, today, let, let me introduce the speaker for today. We have uh, Negar Kiyawash speaking from uh, Lausanne, uh, beautiful Lausanne, Switzerland. So <clears throat> Negar is currently the chair of business analytics at Ecole Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne, EPFL and the College of Management and Technology. Prior to joining EPFL, she was a faculty member at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign for many years, and then at Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta. So her, um, when she was a student also at Illinois, um, where she got a PhD, back then her interests were more on coding theory and information theory. And, um, she did a lot of work on deletion codes and synchronization network, um, uh, like timing channels and things and privacy and, uh, and networks. So now her research areas are sort of expanded a little bit and a lot more into machine learning and related topics. So she's interested broadly in the area of statistical learning and applied probability with special focus on network inference and causality. She's a recipient of the NSF career and uh, over for us uh, one investigator uh, award. So Nagar, please, the floor's all yours. Thank you so much for the introduction, Vijay. So Vijay and I go actually a long time back. You know, we, we are, I guess, pride, uh, proud alumni of CSL. And it's really wonderful to like have this opportunity to give this talk to you guys. And I have never in person visited the Un University of Michigan. And I really regret it being closed when I had my career in Illinois and later in Georgia Tech. Now that I'm further, so it's, um, you know, it's, still nice that because we have technology via zoom i could be here so i'm gonna give the talk please feel free at any point to interrupt me and it would be helpful that if you would sk speak up or i don't know like if because i don't think it's easy for me to see the chat is it possible vijay for people just to ask a question yeah they can and i will monitor the chat also so that it's um there's no hassle. Thank you so much, because I think it's a little bit counterproductive if you get lost somewhere like in the beginning. So I would appreciate if you ask me questions as we go along. So um, this talk is on uh, this problem of database alignment. And I want to talk about some fundamental limits and efficient algorithms for the problem. And as um, Vijay pointed out, I come from a background of information theory. And you're going to see that actually, um, uh, even though this problem looks uh, on the surface on not the classical information theoretic type of problem, it ends up um, having a solution which uses still machinery, which is classically we use in IT. So, um, uh, so I'm gonna quickly give the motivation of the talk, discuss what is the problem that I'll be discussing. And then I would spend a little bit of time talking about some other related problems that um, are also uh, studied. And this relationship uh, might not be clear um, on the first glance. Then I would discuss our results and I would try to give a little bit of outline of the analysis, hopefully to, uh, to shed some light on how these results were derived. So um, we all, of course, know that um, uh, these days, uh, data collection is everywhere, right? So all the way from, um, you know, whenever you surf something on the web to when you make purchases, things are getting monitored. Even we voluntarily use devices like, a, like Apple Watch and so on that, you know, they collect information about our behavior and so on. Um, and of course, this diverse data sets, right? So, uh, so they, they give us this benefit that we can actually pull data from various uh, resources and do things that we couldn't do before. Uh, but also, um, you know, we have now concerns obviously about privacy and this data junction uh, would often like, you know, uh, not be directly possible. So what people do is that, you know, they have to do this anonymization of the data. And of course, still things are preserved, right? The correlation among various data sets, this would be preserved. And uh, this allows um, things that we on the surface might not see possible, but because the correlation, even in the anonymized data gets preserved, you know, you might be able to, you know, align data and be able to do things that were not uh, before feasible to do. So, 
this also, as I said, you know, it's useful that we can use this correlation and do data junction and, you know, have more information to, to pull in, but clearly this uh, creates also a risk in terms of the privacy. And I'm sure you have all seen these type of um, um, headlines that uh, discuss about breaches of uh, privacy that happens in the data sets. So it's actually crucial for us then understand that where do these two limits lie in a sense that then can we use the correlations in the data to be able to um, to enable things that we couldn't do before, but also understand this trade-off between the usefulness of data, because we can actually pull in together versus the threats that you are getting in terms of the privacy, right? So for example, we have tried to obfuscate features, right, by approaches such as introducing artificial noise and so on, which could hurt the data, um, you know, uh, junction uh, approach, but hopefully it helps you in terms of uh, preserving privacy. So a specific problem that I want to talk about here, and this is not in the vein of things like differential privacy, is this so-called alignment problem. So what is this? So alignment problem is a scenario when you have multiple data sources. So for instance, you can have a data structure or a database one or database two, and this could have data pertaining to various entities or users. So when I use a color, these colors are encoding users, right? So you could have two sets of information pertaining to, say, use the blue user, while the user which is in yellow is only, his information is only represented in structure two. And uh, these um, users, um, actually, um, you might try to obfuscate somehow that these are the same people and try to erase the information about the users. And then, you know, the hope is that, you know, this allows you to obfuscate the, uh, the, uh, the correspondence between the data sources. But the fact is that if there is correlation between the data that you are um, storing pertaining to the users, even if you obfuscate, so remove these colors or change the IDs, you could still harness this and then this would allow you to figure out that these were indeed the same uh, users in the two databases. So I want to discuss various versions of this problem first at high level, then I want to say that which one I'm addressing. So in the alignment problem, sometimes you have this, uh, this setting, which is a database. What do I mean by a database? You have users. So again, the colors are encoding these users, these dots. And you can have some information pertaining to a single user. For instance, let's say this was a medical record and then uh, this brown, um, um, so the black line on the right hand side is saying this, what is the feature vector pertaining to this user? So it has some health information or medical record of that. You could also have the case where your alignment is between for a different kind of object. So it's not a database, but it's some sort of a biograph. So what is a biograph? Biograph is when you, you have interactions between users and certain objects. For instance, this could be something like, you know, ratings of movies on, uh, on a uh, on a medium, right? So you, the various entities might have rated various movies, right? Or on Amazon, you purchase products and various users might have rated various products. Yet another set um, of, uh, you know, problems that are interesting is when, where you're trying to do your alignment, the object you're considering is a graph. So what is a graph? The graph is the one that not only has these users and possibly the users could have also features or, you know, you might not even have features for the users, but what you know is their interaction. So you see which users are connected to the other ones. This an example of this is the connections over uh, uh, social media. So this would be three cases where, you know, naturally you could have a notion of alignment. And the focus of this talk for the most part is on the database alignment. So, you know, and you could also have, of course, combination of these. So let me just give you an example. So you see that this is not an artificially constructed problem and indeed it had a ramification in reality. So let's look at this example that we have this so-called bipartite alignment. So this was in the previous slide, the second type that I was considering, right? So you had this uh, situation that Netflix uh, had this prize and they, um, they released the data set and the data set has a set of users 
and some movies as well as ratings. So for instance, in this uh, example, like the, the red, uh, the people that, you know, what I'm capturing in the dots are the ID of the users and they're obfuscated. I've removed the color, hence you don't know who this user is. And on the right hand side, you see the uh, objects that are movies. And let's say for instance, the first user has rated the first two movies and so on, right? So they release this and then, um, you, the goal was to actually in, in their uh, setting was to uh, complete the rating of some of the movies that you did not have um, enough ratings for them or just no rating. So it was a matrix completion setting. And what ended up happening is that because there exists this other data set called IMDB and you might have seen it, in IMDB, most users have to register to be able to uh, rate um, movies. So you have these usernames, again, you have movie names or movie IDs, and then you know you have the rating of these movies on IMDB. So as I mentioned in IMDB, it's common for the users to actually register with full names. So basically what ends up happening is that some of these users might not rate certain movies because they want to not um, give away information. For instance, you know, your interest in movies can can lead to revealing personal information such as your political views, religious beliefs, or even sexual orientation. And then you might have this incentive not to do it on a database where you have your real names. But in a seminal paper actually in 2006 by Vitali and um, his student, it was shown that um, indeed, um, you, the fact that um, this IMDB database exists, you can do matching across these databases and figure out what was the ideas of the folks on Netflix where people felt they were anonymized and they might have rated movies that otherwise they wouldn't have cared, right? Because they thought they're doing this rating under anonymized setting. So it ended up uh, that Netflix had to ha face the class action lawsuit and ended up even canceling uh, the sequel to their competition because of this problem. So this indeed has real ramification, right? So the focus of this talk is for the most part, I'm gonna talk about so-called correlated databases. So what was a correlated database? This is what I was describing um, in a few previous slides. So I have a database, which in general is some unordered set of users um, that, you know, it's, um, uh, it's a set of features that each is associated with a user. And, um, you could have more than a database, as I mentioned, you could have multiple of them. In this talk, we only consider two of them. So I have database A and B. So in each database, I have a user and I'm showing users either by dots or by squares here. And the color means they're the same user. And you, uh, pertaining to each user, there is a vector of features. So for instance, what I'm depicting here, you could see that two users are shared between these two databases, the blue user and the red users, but the other ones are not shared. So each, each of the databases has different set of users. So the important thing is to understand how this, um, what is the generative model of this database? So I'm gonna assume that for any database, the features are IID across the user. So what does it mean? It means that the feature of user A is independent of, actually it's not called them, user one, user blue is independent of the green user, but they have the same distribution. Across the database, when the users are the same person, which I show here with the same color, then you have a joint distribution. So these are this basically captures the correlation among the databases. But across the databases, for various sets of users, the, these joints are independent and identically distributed. So let's review this again to make sure it's clear. So in each database, I have the information of my users are independent, but they have the same distribution. Across the databases, only you have the correlation among the information of the same users. And when you're looking at the users across these databases, what you end up having is that they're independent, their information, but they have the same distribution, right? So their IID. Is the model clear? Yes, Nigar, it's clear to me, but actually I had a follow-up question on that. Sure. I mean, isn't this a strong assumption, the independence uh, across users? Because I mean, any of these databases are useful in a machine learning problem because there's correlation among users. 
Um, well, the fact that I can infer. Are, you know, you could, of course, you know, ideally you want to have a more general setting. You're absolutely yeah. correct. But you're going to see the problem is going to be very difficult even to capture. In no, this no, I understand for uh, an analysis, this is a good starting model. I mean, it's like the binary symmetric channel or something else. It's a simple starting model, but. Um, but I was just but I curious. Think it's also not completely, you know, deprived in a sense that you think that, you know, the way you rate movies is independent, right, from other people, let's say, right? So, so in certain problems, this actually makes sense. Of course, depends on the task you're doing. So let's say, you know, you could have these notions that, you know, in problems that are interested in like things like collaborative filtering, this exactly breaks that, right? So it would be a useless mm -hmm. model there because you indeed want to harness the correlation between the people, right? So there's similarity. Yes. Yeah, very good question. So, and, and then, um, just to explain the mathematical model, I'm gonna assume that you know for um, each of the databases, I have a set of user identities. I'm gonna use Cal U for database A and Cal V for database B. In general, they don't have to have the same cardinality. And there is a mapping between these identifiers. So remember that some of these users are the same and I'm gonna call this mapping between the identifiers M as my matching. So once you have this map M, it actually induces this extra notation. So I'm gonna have this WM, which is the pairs that are mapped by M. I would have U subscript M, which is the mapped users from database A and uh, calligraphic V subscript M is the mapped users from B. So this would be basically a set of users that are part of this matching, right? And I would also have these other features. So, so this um, feature X, which is gonna be any arbitrary feature from database A, and Y is gonna be any arbitrary feature from database B. And I, I just call them features, but they, they could really be a vector of features. So let's keep that in mind, you know, just for ease, I, I call them feature with that meaning for them to be a scalar. So the way I describe this generative model, then I can have these marginals, right? So these are the marginals of each of these features for any database. So for instance, in database B, I have F of Y, which is describing the marginal of the feature of uh, some feature Y in database B. Similarly, FX captures that for database A. As you recall, when I had the same user across the databases, I assume there is a joint there and this joint is defined conditions on this matching, right? So when I have this matching M, then I know that for instance, blue users are part of the same uh, matching. Hence, I can talk about their joint, which is this FXY. And this actually holds the same distribution for the red ones as well, because I assumed for them to be IID. Once you have this distribution, then I can describe a notion of likelihood for a database, right? So given a matching or a map M, then for all the um, pairs U and V that are part of the matching, their joint likelihood of their features is governed by this joint FX of Y given a cer certain mapping. Then for those features that are not captured by this part, they're not part of the matching in database A, hence I look at U set minus UM. So these are the guys that were not part of the matching in database A. Then they're just governed by the marginal F of X. Similar thing holds for the other database B where you have this basically uh, matching which is captured by F of Y. Hence, I can describe this likelihood function I'm gonna now, to make my life a bit easier, I'm gonna do a little change. So recall the two other sums are considering the users that are not part of the matching. If I were to add those users to my summation, then I need to also subtract them. And this subtraction is done by, uh, you know, just including these guys in the denominator of the first term. So basically the two uh, likelihoods are equal in the, in, the, in the top and bottom of the slide. The only thing is now I can actually get rid of the two bottom terms because they don't depend on my matching. It's just to make the, um, you know, to, to keep track of things in an easier way. Is this clear? Thank you. So what is nice is that, you know, so uh, once you have this max, when you have a likelihood function, I can then, based on the availability of these um, 
joints that I have, I, I, you know, given a certain mapping, I can see what is the likelihood of that specific mapping. And then you can talk about now maximization over this M, you know, and then what you end up doing is you can actually do a ML for this problem and then try to do the ML, as I said, only on the first term because these things didn't depend on that. So now I have this problem where I can talk about my matching is the correct matching is the one that is going to maximize this likelihood to to make life easier in the rest of the talk and you would see in a little bit why i do that i'm going to define this information density matrix so what is this information density matrix i'm just taking these um, values that are in my summation and you know you this is why it's called the information density it's, it's analogous to notion of information density that you have in information theory let's say for mutual information right so it's not an expectation you're just taking these values right uh, these logs and I can now make a matrix. So what is the size of this matrix? So this matrix is U um, times V where recall that U was the cardinality of the, um, uh, uh, was the was the side was the indices of the first database and v was the other one right so basically for any pair of users you can calculate this information density. This is what we call GUV. Then I can also describe my mapping in terms of a matrix. So this matrix would have a one, again, it's of the same cardinality. It's like, it only has zeros and ones. And whenever you have a one at some entry, let's say UV, it means that you and V were part of our map or matching, right? So I basically consider these two IDs, U and V, to be across the databases um, describing the same user. And otherwise you have a zero there. So in summary, when I'm looking at this uh, me uh, maximum likelihood that I wanted to do, I can write my likelihood function as this um, inner product between the two matrices. And what is, if you haven't seen this notation, this inner product is nothing except basically, if you have two matrices, you, you do um, component by component multiplication and you sum over it, which is then you would see that why this exactly gives you this um, basically likelihood function that we have here. So please note that in what I had here, my G is always computable. The reason it's computable, I assume that I have access to this um, uh, basically joint and the marginal over the databases, right? So M is in general a partial permutation matrix because you know, as I told you, you have um, these databases that are not of the same size. If indeed I know the size of my matching, then you can, uh, it can be shown that, you know, this maximizing this um, uh, basically inner product or my likelihood function is just the so-called uh, linear assignment problem or the unbalanced one when the size of these databases are not the same. And this could in general be solved using a Hungarian algorithm in polynomial time in size of uh, your matching, your databases and so on. So this is actually something you could do in polynomial time, which is really nice for, uh, for these guys. But please note that MLE optimizes over all mappings, right? So this is too costly if one is not in general interested in finding the complete mapping. So in some cases, you might actually care for less. So you might be happy just doing this so-called maximum row alignment. So what is maximum row alignment. So it means you're given a user in database A and you want to find the feature in database B, which is most correlated with this guy, right? So you're gonna ignore all other features in A and then pick the feature in B that maximizes the likelihood. So this is basically equivalent to picking the max entry in a row of that matrix G that I described for you. You might even wanna do something less ambitious in other cases, right? So you might not even uh, you know, care about this. You would be fine with just doing a thresholding, which what do I mean by that? You wanna decide whether a given feature pair looks correlated to you or not. And by looks correlated, it means you just do a likelihood ratio test with some threshold and then you know you you basically accept this if the corresponding entry is g above this threshold that you know you you are interested in finding so more precisely mathematically i can describe all of these still as lps so let's first do the first one so the 
original one, which is the maximum likelihood, remember that I want to maximize this matrix inner product. And then um, it, it, you know, because I want this to be a partial matching, I would have some, uh, some constraints. So the bottom constraint is obvious. It's just the way I define my matching that these M's are either zeros or ones, right? And then the other two are making sure that, you know, uh, this actually is a partial matching. And the reason I have equality for V and inequality for one is just because I, you know, with that loss of generality, I assume that the smaller database is the one with the index U. So if I was doing the maximum row estimation, then what ends up being is that, you know, in a sense, you are relaxing that, right? So you, you don't need to have the first requirement, which was like, you know, considering the rest of the information in the matrix, you were just doing it over a certain row. And this was end up in the LP that I have on the bottom of the slide. Also, please pay attention that if I were to remove uh, some constant value tau from G, it actually doesn't change anything in any of my programs. The reason is, you know, I'm, I'm forcing anyways to this constraint uh, that, you know, the sum of the M's are one, you know, it takes care of things. So this allows me then to write thresholding very easily too. So I'm just gonna, you know, consider the two former programs. And then because I have this thresholding here, I, I remove this minus tau, which is my required threshold. And then I end up having in a sense like relaxation of the previous program, right? So this was the max row. I'm, uh, I'm relaxing this um, basically equality, uh, the sum equals to one to just be that, you know, each of these has to be less than one. So you would have a nice description of these things in terms of the LP. Is the LP clear? Yeah. Thank you. So now let's see what, what results do we learn here, right? So I can describe the problem. It's like, you know, mathematically well-defined, but let's see what happens here. So what we have is that, you know, we recall that, you know, I, I had this general setting and I don't have results for the most general case. So I'm gonna make some further assumption here. So one of them is that I'm going to assume that I have a finite alphabet database. What do I mean by that? It means the features that I was having this X's and Y's are coming from some finite alphabet setting. If this is the case, we would see that some in a little bit like just in a slide, we would see that the critical uh, information theoretic measure here is going to be this circulant basically um, uh, a mutual information, which in a second I'm gonna describe for you. And this is gonna basically capture, uh, you know, what happens in this setting. So um, to make life easier for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna assume that my databases are all of the same size and the size of them is N. And I'm gonna first describe the case when I'm interested in a complete matching. So I wanna complete everybody across these databases. This is just to make, you know, just have one variable N which I'm taking care of. And in general, these databases are big. So you can assume that N is going to infinity. So I have two main results. One is the achievability. So the achievability says that this information theoretic measure, which I haven't told you yet what it is, it's gonna pop up in a slide or two. If this is larger than a certain threshold, and this threshold is just this two log n, where n was size of my database, then the maximum likelihood um, can actually find the correct, uh, pro correct mapping with probability one minus O of one. So basically this is going uh, to one. We also have a converse, which is very close in a sense that, you know, so if you again have that this uh, value, um, the critical value, this information theoretic value, as long as it's less than two log n, means you don't have enough correlation between the databases, then no algorithm can find the correct matching with large enough probability. So probability of finding the large, the correct um, mapping goes to zero. So this is the main result that we have in this space. And I want to, um, um, you know, in, in the next slide, I'm going to describe that what does this really mean a little bit like, you know, explain the result better. But for now, I hope it's clear that, that this information theoretically, like we have a complete answer here in a sense here that it's telling you that I need to make sure that this correlation in terms of this 
uh, quantity that pops up from my analysis has to be larger than these two log n for me to be reliably find the exact matching. If it's less than that, then I can never learn the exact matching. So it's not a matter of complexity, it's just impossible. So is the result clear? Uh, yes, I had a question on the converse part. I mean, do you yes. also, can you also characterize, so you say you're not finding the correct mapping, but if I say that I get, can you characterize, I get 90% of the mapping uh, correct, or do you have a sense of how how much Excellent. error? Excellent, so, so this really, I want to get the correct mapping, right? So if I wanna get something which has like, good enough has a vanishing, I would have another result. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So for now, I wanna exactly learn the mapping, not 90% of that, but this is a very good question because exactly like in reality, even if you learn 90% of a mapping, it's a huge problem, right? In terms of breach of security. It's not that you have to learn the algorithm exactly. So I'll get to that just in a few slides. Thanks Vijay for the very good question. So let's see what happens here. So if you are in this case of the finite alphabet, right? So, um, and I'm looking at these databases, let's assume that, you know, they, they're of the same size. So I hope that you realize that regardless, um, you know, uh, of the, the setting, the smallest error I can make is that, you know, two people are wrong, right? So because if I'm mixing a user, then, you know, both of them are wrong. So if I'm mixing user one with user two, not only user one is mapped wrong, but also user two. So the smallest error I would always make is a size two. So let's consider two mappings. I'm going to call them small m and small m prime that are same everywhere. So they, they're the same, except they mess up the mapping between uh, two users. So, um, uh, so sorry, they, that, you know, so they're just different between two users. And let's assume for the rest of the talk that M is the correct mapping. So the, in the correct mapping, user U1 should have been mapped to V1 and U2 to V2. In the wrong mapping, it switches a user. So what it does is it takes the user one by mistake, it maps it to um, V2 and does the same for the other guy. So for U2, which was corresponding to V2, it's also gonna erroneously pick the other guy, right? So basically this is in a sense the smallest possible error a mapping can make, right? So you mess up two users. So if I ended up picking M prime as the correct mapping, that's when I make an error. It meant that in my analysis of likelihood, this um, basically quantity that I was maximizing ended up being larger when I was using the wrong mapping M prime, right? And recall the definition I had there, which basically in that case, right? So if you were just summing this up over all the Gs, but they're everywhere the same. So everything is gonna cancel out except these terms. And then, because this was an error, obviously I, 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 I chose M, M prime, which means that, you know, this value was larger than zero, right? That's the case when you make an error. But also recall what was the form of these Gs. So this was what I called my information density. And then what I can do here now is that, you know, I can just look at probability of this event. So I wanna see what is the probability that I'm gonna take this wrong map that only differs from the correct one in, in two users, given that the true mapping was actually the small m. And I can use just the Chernoff bound. So writing the Chernoff bound for the expression that I had on the previous slides give you this actually expectation. And because I'm taking the expectation of this G's of this form, and remember that, um, you know, uh, uh, so you're taking the expectation, so you need to actually multiply it by this Fx, Fy, hence they gotta uh, cancel out. And then what I end up getting is something of this form, right? So let's look at what I had here. So I have this square root here, and then because I'm taking the expectation, it cancels out and you get basically the term on the top. So this is what you end up getting, right? So this becomes the value of, uh, you know, this error probability that I'm considering here. But I wanna do a little bit more work here. And what I do is this. So I'm gonna make an observation is that if I had some matrix Z, which I'm gonna define this matrix Z, which the entries are always between zero and one. And the size of it is basically depend on size of my alphabet. Remember X and Y were the finite alphabet that I had for each of these uh, feature spaces. So I can define this Z of X, Y as just the square root of this uh, joint that I have. And if I define such a matrix Z, then the probability that I was calculating up there with a little bit of work, you can see that it ends up being trace of this object. 
So this object, I'm gonna now define it as I circle and two. The two is there because this is the case when you are just mixing two users, right? In general, you can have this for like, you know, a larger cycle that, that you know, mixes more users. So this quantity that I was talking before, now I can describe this information theoretic quantity, right? It's something you can calculate. It's a matrix Z that I can form in terms of these joints of the features I have. And then all I need to do is I calculate some trace of um, this basically um, matrix and then take the minus log of it. So now this is what I was describing to you before. This is indeed where this calculation ended up coming but this is just to give you an idea like i haven't really proved this for you yet because there's no reason that the only mapping that causes problem for you is the one that uses two users but i just wanted you to see like where this object comes from and in the analysis we're gonna see that this indeed the dominant error term is this guy so this is why like i end up only caring about what happens when you mix two users so Another setting where we can also capture again this object and understand this is when we have this so-called Gaussian databases. So what's the Gaussian database is when the features in NIB in both data sets A and B take values that are um, basically uh, this multivariate Gaussians, right? So each of the features of a user are multivariate Gaussians. And what you end up having in this setting is actually the measure that pops out is something we know, a classical one is just the mutual information, which I'm gonna use this I, X and Y to show the mutual information. So what does the form of the result look in this setting? It's very similar to before, except that instead of this I circulant that I have, now I would have just the mutual information has to be larger than two log n you you again have like in the case of exact recovery you can do this with probability one minus o of one and if your uh, correlation in terms of your mutual information being between the databases being smaller than this two log n no matter what algorithm you use you 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 cannot correct this right so you can only do it with probability going to zero so these results basically considered only estimation a success if you wanted the exact mapping. And this was the question BJ asked. What if you're not that ambitious and you're okay as long as the, um, uh, the ratio of the errors is vanishingly small? So in that case, if uh, you uh, are okay with the almost exact alignment, we get the results which are depicted in the bottom of the slide. So here, what we would end up having, you again have achievability and converses, but I want to draw your attention to what happens in terms of the threshold. So indeed, you can reduce your requirement of how much correlation you need. So here, your correlation can be a factor of two smaller than before. So instead of two log n, I'm getting log n. But here, the thing that I'm gonna get is that, you know, I, my algorithm makes certain number of the errors right in the expectation, but, uh, you know, you, you don't have any more uh, getting the exact mapping. So this is basically the setting that Vijay was asking. And you could have lower, um, correlation because you're also less ambitious you're okay if you know you you don't get the exact alignment so it might so, also help to look yes do i have a the, question uh, yes. in the second converse that you have the almost exact alignment can you also characterize what fraction of errors you make if you if you are say some C log n where C is less than one, strictly less than one. Yes, so what we can find, which I'm gonna in a second describe to you in the next um, slide, is that you, you can learn the error exponent. Okay. Yeah, so exactly what you, 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 you're asking is, like, I think it's a little bit easier to see it pictorially because when you write all these omega notations, it's not clear what's going on, right? And, I, and you would now see, I think hopefully hear better what is going on. So let's say, we're, let's just for now stick to the Gaussian case, right? So I'm just drawing the Gaussian alignment and I'm gonna um, show this, uh, what is it that we can do in terms of like expectation of our errors, which is what Vijay is asking in some sense, expected number of the errors. I'm gonna show them as N to the Y. So my Y is the exp error exponent. And remember N was the size of my databases, right? So this Y axis is capturing that right uh, uh, basically this um, expected number of my errors right and i'm 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 
just to make things nicer to see it, I'm, I'm plotting this log of E over log of N. And then my X axis is telling what is the correlation, right? So remember the correlation is I of X, Y, and I'm again here just normalizing it by log N, right? So this would be my axis. So recall what my converse was saying. I think converses are even easier to see. So recall what I said is that in case of exact alignment, if I don't have enough correlation, but I describe my enough correlation, this two log N, and remember I was normalizing the axis by log N. So if X is less than two, then I know that basically Y is larger than zero, right? So that is basically mean that I, this would be the region I'm in. So it means that I make mistake on, uh, on you know non-negligible uh, amount of my entries, right? So you do a bad job. If I was looking at the case where I didn't want to learn the exact mapping, remember what was my threshold. So this was this uh, log n. And here, what you would end up getting, you would actually get exponents that are now larger than one, right? So in this um, basically y-axis, and this would be the red region, which is what you end up having. What is achievable region? So achievable region in the case that you uh, you have high correlation, high correlation was this two thing, right? So basically I'm looking at where, so on this side of the line where x is larger than two, then what you end up having is that you actually can see what is the form of the, so this, um, is basically the form of the exponent that you would get is this two minus X, right? So that would be the form. And this is the region we get for MLE. Interestingly enough, we can do a little bit also more work and then look at what happens in the achievability region when you, uh, you had the basically low correlation. So their X was larger than one. And what you end up getting is this other green part. Again, this is for the full matching the MLE. If, on the other hand, you did not care about, um, you know, learning the entire correspondence, but you wanted to just do this other easier problems, that one was the maximum row alignment, for instance, in the uh, high correlation regime, you can again see what happens to the exponent, as well as you can see what happens to the exponent in the low correlation regime. And these are the curves that are plotted here. So um, this basically blue one, and the curve has two regions, right? So it changes. It might not be completely easy to see, but it's linear at one part, and then uh, um, on uh, on the top it actually is curving because you know you you have this um, uh, term which is not linear anymore. Less ambitious of all of them was when you were just doing the thresholding, right? And if you were doing the thresholding, then you know you you end up having an achievability region that correspond to this cyan color in these curves. So I hope this actually allows you to see in terms of X1, and this is Vijay's question, like which is more useful, like what can you actually recover in this setting? So if this is clear, I want to shortly describe to you some uh, related problems. Is this clear so far? I'll let someone else answer. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I hope this is okay. So yeah, I I want, clear. Okay. So I want to quickly, I think the results are kind of clear. I mean, the analysis is a little bit more cumbersome, but I hope I can get to that and let me tell you about the analysis, you know, because I think it's at least good to see one easy case. So you, you see where it comes from. So some interesting thing is that there are a bunch of related problems to this one. And surprisingly enough, like this is a very nice paper by my friend Yi Hong Wu and um, uh, Zhuaming Shu, Shu. And this is a new result. And even though our result is from 2018, they actually not even mention it in the paper. And I don't think this is at all an omission to not give credit because I think it's not obvious to see that there is a relation between the problems. And this is why I want to tell you guys about it. I hope this is interesting to you too, because like it was very exciting to us when we figured out like how exactly the problems are related. So there's this famous other problem, which is called so-called planted matching. So what is a planted matching? So before I describe the planted matching, I want to just one second, you know, tell you exactly what we were doing. Remember, I had this matrix G, which was capturing the true mapping between my users, right? So let's say from the rest of this part that I'm discussing, the blues are the true matching, the reds are erroneous things you could actually by mistake try to match people. And recall that I was calculating this G. So for any basically pair of users, I was calculating this information density. And then 
if you recall, you know, in this setting, I was uh, solving this, uh, in general, this unbalanced uh, assignment problem, and then figuring out like which one was the max weight uh, matching that, you know, in this case, you, you learned. And of course, sometimes you could have errors and do the wrong thing. So this was what we were doing here. And this is very much related to this problem of planted matching. And let me in a second tell you what is a planted matching setting. In the planted matching, you again have this two sets of users, but here you have a relationship between them. So what do I mean by a relationship? So some process is generating some edges for you. So you, you have these true edges, which is the true matching, the blue ones, and you could have possibly some subset of other edges that exist here. And these edges um, are not part of the true mapping. And what ends up happening is that, you know, um, these basically, um, edges have different probabilities. So I think it's easier to let's just look at here. So what I'm saying is that, you know, you, you have some true matching here. The edges that correspond to the true matching, they have a weight that comes from a certain distribution P. The edges that are not part of the mapping, they're also IID, but they come from another distribution. And in their analysis, this distribution has to have a specific form, which is, you know, distributions of uh, this form. And then what are these uh, quantities? So I have the value D there, right? So this uh, D is the average degree of the, of the graph. And then in this bipartite graph, and N, if you recall, was the size of these index sets, right? So like the users U or V that you have in this problem. So this is different from our problem because you only would have a weight for edges that were generated, so they existed. So if you look at this matrix, unlike the one we had before, some of these guys are now like, you have like, as if you had the erasure, right? So you have no value there because as long as it, a, a edge doesn't exist, you don't have a weight between those users. So the goal of this problem is also identifying the matching M. And, you know, so here is that, you know, you what you end up, learning is that you know this matching m recall that you know it of course comes um, the true matching the, the edges have a different distribution than the other ones and then the question is that you know when would you be able to learn this and what you can show is it's going to depend on how different are of course these distributions if they're too similar there's no way you can distinguish the true matching from the other ones and if you have seen some of these problems uh, for um, um you know uh, when um, uh, let's see call that and drawing a blank. So in also the graphical setting, when you do community detection, it's very similar to the problem of community detection, uh, you know, where you have these edges and the connection between the edges of different communities have different distributions. So here, what you end up, um, you know, what the critical value ends up being the Bocciacharya distance between the two distributions. And very nicely here, again, there is a converse and there's achievability and it's tight as you can see. And you, you actually figure out that, you know, if you're correlation is, um, you know, between uh, these, if this, um, basically the distance is uh, uh, too low between these two um, probabilities, you can't learn the true matching, otherwise you do a good job and actually learn them. So if we were to look at how does this relate to our problem, I want to say there's another issue here between these two problems. It's not just that we have the complete matrix, but the rest is the same. There is actually one other complication in our problem, which does not exist in the other one. So recall that, you know, the way I was giving each of these Gs was, you know, calculating this information densities. And please like, you know, note that, you know, there, this scores um, are, you know, for the true pairs are IID. And this is what I discussed earlier, that for the matching, you would get this IID things, right? This was what the matching was inducing between them. But what you end up having, all the false scores are not independent anymore. Because if, for instance, you're considering the values on some row U, then these are all functions of this AU, right? So basically the P features that are, um, you know, uh, uh, correspond to that database. The similar thing holds for across the columns as well. So none of the red things in our setting are any more uh, independent. While in the other problem, all the red features that you consider in this setting, right? So these basically 
red values here were all independent and they were coming from some distribution Q. So in general, this is a much harder problem because you have correlations which you don't have them in the planted matching. But there is a special case of our problem that in the limit, you can actually get this independence similar to the planted flick. So when is that? So if you have uh, Gaussian databases and you assume that the number of your dimensions are going to infinity, right? And then also the mutual information between any finite subset of the features is small, then you would have this nice property that asymptotically G also is going to get this independent entries. And then I can talk similarly, you know, you get the similar feature there that for the true pairs, you have a certain uh, distribution for the erroneous pairs, you have another distribution. They're both normal with different means and the same variance, right? So if that is the case, then one might be tempted to see that is the result we are getting consistent with the result of the Ding et al. But actually, you cannot apply their, um, their, um, uh, their analysis because if you recall, I, I told you that the Q there, uh, which was the distribution of non-matched pairs, should have a specific uh, form. And here, these uh, Gaussians do not satisfy that specific form. Nonetheless, we just checked the Botticaria distance for it, even though they shouldn't apply. And then we also checked our threshold. And it's really nice because you end up getting exact same correspondence. So this means that the analysis we do and their analysis coincides for this problem, which makes us think that maybe the assumptions that they make on Q, which was they used it for their analysis is not really necessary for the problem to work. It is just the artifact of the analysis, right? Because these uh, basically end up coinciding. And also it's nice because it shows that our approach could be used to analyze that problem and you know, basically the machinery here is stronger. And the reason it's stronger is as I told you, we can even manage correlations between things. So is this clear? Um, yeah. Excellent. So another related problem is actually this graph alignment. And this is where we came to this problem. So what is this one? So in this classical setting, it's just graph isomorphism. What does that mean? So I have two graphs that are identical and then I, I remove the name of the vertices across them or I call them differently. Can you use the topology of the graph to learn that, you know, what is the vertex correspondence? And this is a problem that goes all the way back to, Erd to Erdos, at least for the case of the erdos rheini graphs. He looked at this, um, you know, graph isomorphism problem there. So what we were interested in looking at, and it's the problem that got me to this database alignment, was the case where your edges are not exactly the same, but they're correlated. So basically there is a, a joint distribution that you know um, describes that how likely are you to have an edge across the two graphs and we uh, in the setting we looked at the easiest one is actually you assume that these correlated pairs are um, iid and there i don't want to go to the details of it but you end up getting some you know uh, proxy for your likelihood which here you have to lift it and instead of working with vertices you have to actually look at pairs of vertices the edges hence you see things look nastier so you are you don't look at just entries in this wm but you're looking at you know these uh, pairs of vertices or edges and you know, we can again have this description of this matrix G, which now has a larger cardinality, but then you can also talk about uh, some vector M now, which this vector is of this length U times V, and uh, you have one when there is um, uh, a basically uh, these, uh, there's a correspondence between the vertices in these two graphs. And you end up being able to actually, again, describe this uh, alignment problem as type of a program, but the program you end up getting here, and um, you know, you can also have a convex relaxation of it in certain times. I don't want to go through all of these details. You end up getting something which is different than the database alignment. Namely, in database, I had this LP here. I end up getting actually a quadratic uh, problem. But still, you know, these problems are also interested in some sense. If I, I sometimes get this question, how is this related to the graph problem, right? And then, uh, you know, in, in one of them, you're finding the uh, max weight matching in a bipartite graph. In the other one, you're finding a max weight subgraph in, in the graph. So mathematically, this is what you're doing in these two problems. So 
I want to just give a short outline of my analysis and then I would be done. Sorry if I'm taking too long, but recall that I was talking about this basically um, problem that we had for the database alignment. And I was doing this um, composition in general, if I'm doing the right thing and I'm finding the right users, this is what you find for your matrix M, right? So you have one on the correct entries. If you were messing up the matching and you were making a mistake, let's say you were picking up M prime, so it's the wrong mapping. Let's see what does this wrong mapping do? It would have actually one somewhere which is not across this basically diagonal. They're all over the place. And then I, I get this red stuff and I can look at M prime minus M and you end up observing that you get this block structure. So what does that mean? It means in places that I did a good job, so the matching is correct, like the green one, it's zero. For the ones I make mistake, then I get this property that I get this minus and plus ones, but they're all concentrated in these blocks. So if I was considering then a matching M prime and it was in, let's say it was just inducing two blocks, then I can actually make my life easier. And instead of considering this, consider two other separate matching on, on subsets of users. So I consider M prime and M, um, M prime one and M prime two, which each of them is doing basically this mistake. So I'm just partitioning it. And this then, allows me to observe that if I was looking indeed at my likelihood, I would again have this decomposition. And this means that I don't, if I make a mistake in my general likelihood for M prime, it is equivalent to basically making a mistake that, you know, either I was making a mistake at this M1 prime or M2 prime, right? So I, I need to just consider these two smaller errors. And this allows me to limit my attention to just single block of alignment and not worry too much about it. So let's, without loss of generality, assume that, you know, I'm looking at one of these blocks and then M is the true matching and M prime is some false mapping. So please pay attention that every time a user is mapped, right, by any of these things, it's only once, right? So both in the correct matching or at the wrong matching, you know, you're always mapped once by this matching, right? Because you always had one exiting edge from each of these users, right? So this means that all the errors that I can make are of this form, either they're cycles like the first one, or they are various paths. And then we call these different paths, different things, right? But they're either paths or they're cycles. So if my size of the databases are the same, I never end up having this path situation. Everything is a cycle. So for ease, I'm gonna just stick to that case when size of my, um, my databases are the same. So my only errors are, you know, these cycles that I'm mixing users, right? So let's just look at this. And I hope that it's clear that if I have a false mapping, then it should at least do a cycle of lengths for, right? Because I was making mistake between at least two users, right? We described this earlier. And then I can, you know, in this case, write exactly what would be like, you know, my churn of bound, right? So then um, you could exactly see, for instance, in the finite alphabet case that, you know, you would make a mistake here uh, with the churn of bound and it would be this exponent in terms of that I circulant that I had described earlier for you. For the Gaussian database, you get the same thing, except that you get this different mutual information. And what we can actually now look at is that, you know, we can, um, if you don't have exactly size four cycle, but you have some two delta cycle, then I don't get an exact bound, but I get an upper bound still. So I can write the churn of bounds, which would be of this form. And then to just make my life easy, because they look similar, I'm going to drop these uh, notations whenever there is a uh, basically uh, information theoretic uh, quantity of interest, I'm just gonna use I. And in one case is the circulant one, in the other one is the mutual information. So now recall that I have this one for a cycle when I make a mistake on a cycle of size two delta. So the question is how many of these cycles they are because I can do the dumbest thing possible, which is a union bound, right? So I'm gonna just count these cycles. And of course the number of cycles is this, and this is obvious because I'm just from N picking delta of them. And then, you know, you're considering various mappings inside that this is delta minus one. Um, factorial, right? And you can upper bound this just by this quantity n to the delta over delta. And then 
what is nice now, I knew that what was the error I was getting for each of them. And, uh, you know, now I have this many of these and I can actually use this notion of the bound and then, you know, ca calculate what is the error that I would get there for uh, basically this is the expected number of these cycles that I have right in this matching. And then I can talk about what would be my error. So as I mentioned, this is the simplest case is that I'm doing a union bound. So please note that this union bound is definitely loose, right? Because I just told you that user can be only part of one cycle, but then I'm counting multiple cycles, right? I'm just summing them up in my union bound. Nonetheless, you know, it still makes things work out for us, right? So, you know, so if um, still we would do that, you know, when I, I, I do this, uh, calculation, I end up getting that the number expected number of my errors from these cycles is going to be this quantity, which is a simple union bound thing. And then um, the special case would be, of course, you know, would be that you, you, you basically um, have, you know, this was for a cycle of length delta. So you have to consider all of them, right, for all these cases. So I consider all possible deltas. I don't consider delta being one because you, you have to always make a mistake between two users. So the smallest uh, cycle I have is four. Hence, if you wonder why this summation starts from two. And then I have now this quantity and I can show that this, if this i is larger than two log n, then this value is always upper bounded by um, this quantity where my a is just this value and this actually ends up giving um, exactly the result I wanted to have right so this was the achievability that I was getting in this case and I can also show that you know if I consider this geometric series and I was like you know considering the case when um, you know um, uh, basically uh, you can actually show that this uh, this indeed converges to O of one, then I have my I to be just a little bit larger than that value, which is by this uh, lower bound omega of one. And this is where you get the, uh, the, the result. So why does this approach fail for the low correlation? And it has a much harder analysis in that case is because exactly because of that union bounding that I was telling you. So basically this intersection between the non-disjoint errors is gonna be too big and then the union bound doesn't work and we need to do something more clever. In interest of time, I'm sorry, I'm with two minutes even over the limit, I apologize for that. So I'm not gonna describe the low correlation regime, but actually you can analyze also the low correlation regime, but it's just, needs much more machinery to to be able to actually handle keep a handle of the error you cannot use a simple union bound so i hope uh, this is clear if i have questions i would love to take them now thank you uh, thanks nigar so i had a few questions but maybe if anyone else has questions we can first go with them Okay, so maybe I can ask my question. I asked a few questions already. But one was the, um, <clears throat> in terms of algorithms, I mean, you use the Hungarian algorithm mostly, most of the time because you have an LP type thing, but um, in the, if it was a maximum weighted matching problem, there are, uh, I mean, belief propagation actually does work and then it actually gives you a lower complexity on the average. Um, would there, I mean, do you know of, that's been applied in this context or not? So excellent question, right? So in the case of database problem, so I think most of what people were interested in was like, what was first, what was information theoretically, of course, possible, but then you care about efficient algorithm. Most of the people who have worked on this um, VJ are, um, people are there like similar to me or, uh, you know, people like Boaz, Barak and so on that are, I would say more CS theory computational, um, you know, they care about computational complexity. So somehow for them, the database alignment is, is okay, right? Because you, you, you have a polynomial time algorithm there. There's a lot of interest is for the graph matching. So it's the problem on the right, which we don't know at all what's going on. In a sense that for certain regions, we indeed know that you can find polynomial algorithms 
And for some other ones, we know that, you know, they're, you know, that the problem is gonna be, it's not polynomial time, right? But exactly how does it behave is not well known. And so there is a paper by my group that for a specific setting, we can actually use, um, uh, we extend one of the work of um, uh, Erdos to this setting, which you, you use the high degree vertices, and then you can do uh, some efficient matching there. Um, and in a sense, it's actually linear time. It's very nice, but it's for a very small region. So there is um, a discussion of this, which we have in one of our papers, and I would be happy to share with you if you're interested. I think it's in the algorithmic paper, which I didn't at all touch, but we don't know what's going on in the in the right hand side problem, even in terms of complexity. So the left hand side, you're absolutely right. I mean, if you just care about polynomial time, sure, you say the uh, you know, Hungarian algorithm, but if you care about efficiency, it might be that algorithms, as you were mentioning, right? So I mean, uh, because, uh, I mean Hungarian algorithm, as you said, is M, uh, in this case, if you're, if it's M, it's M cubed or N cubed. Yes. It's you would not do it for any real database. No, exactly. So even that's nasty practically, right? So, but, but you know, like, because we just even cared about what is the, you know, in, in this setting, is there anything even polynomial, especially from the graph alignment, in a sense, I was satisfied that there was this, but you are correct. And this is one of the reasons I was talking about the easier problems, exactly because the complexity doesn't scale, right? So the reason I talked about these other problems, right, that we were talking about the threshold setting or the, um, uh, or the, but I mean, so the other thing I felt, I mean, so in, so suppose you did either the threshold or the other outcome, this is the second thing I had. Could yeah. you use that as a bootstrap to say, okay, I already have some seeds that I've already recovered. And then, I mean, again, I could have a simpler algorithm then. Excellent right? question. So if, for instance, in graph matching, there is a lot of work on, you know, using seeds to be efficient. And we have a result, which is very nice, I think in my humble opinion, because it shows that, you know, seeds actually don't help you there. So, but I don't know what happens in this setting. Yes, absolutely. You can do one of these easier ones as a seed. And this is, you know, um, like, you know, and people uh, like, you know, so Matthias Grossglauser and his uh, former student, Ehsan Kazemi had this work in context of graph matching that they look at this percolation from seeds. Yes. And I think Yi Hong has also some nice work in this area as well with drumming. So if you like, I would be very happy to send you all these papers, but yeah, so I have not worked at all on the more efficient things for the case of the databases, but I was interested in efficient algorithms for the graphs and for a long time we worked on it. And the last one, the same, in the same thread was if you had Gaussian, wouldn't you, are there spectral algorithms that would work well or not quite, you know, Sorry, what were you saying? What I was... mean, if you're in the Gaussian feature case, suppose you want, I mean, you looked at it as some spectral algorithm, would there, would some spectral algorithms work well or not? Yeah, really? this is a very good question. So indeed what uh, drumming is looking at, the case they're looking is the spectral algorithms. Yes, okay. absolutely. That's exactly what they're doing. So uh, let me ask one more question. And then I think I've asked a bunch of other things already. And I think you're meeting with uh, Al and Mardi soon. So I don't want to take too much time of their time. Uh, so you're in your uh, first, the finite feature uh, thing, you had this particular circle and entropy uh, calculation. I, it comes across naturally in your problem, but is there an intuitive sort of understanding? And the way I'm saying is some of it, it's in part of your results, you describe it as a Renyi entropy. So there's usually some connections of guessing with Renyi entropy. Um, but maybe just understanding it has some connotations to the Bhattacharya uh, distance. So maybe that's how one should understand how it intuitively plays a role. Yeah, I think that's a good question, but honestly, I don't have a good intuition. This is what naturally just comes from writing the error terms, right? And I don't do anything crazy except using a Chernoff bound and the analysis. I mean, these values just come from analysis. And I had never even seen that, you know, the what we call this I circulant. It's something that just popped up in this setting. And um, it's interesting that, you know, for the, so I don't really think the Bhattacharya is the right um, metric to be honest, because if you notice it, it only coincides when you have very special setting, right? Which is what I was mm -hmm. trying to get here. So, yeah. you know, so so you, you only get this Bhattacharya distance when all these, uh, 
uh, you know, uh, non-true matching pairs, what I was showing in, a, in, in red are independent. Then, you know, it reduces to that, but really the correct object in terms of uh, if things are Gaussian would end up being the mutual information. So in a sense, none of our result is subsuming the other one, right? So they have very limiting assumptions in terms of this independence and on their Q function, which our Gaussian doesn't even satisfy that. But on the other hand, they allow a general distribution P and Q. I mean, P is general, Q somewhat general, and the Bhattacharya comes in. If you have, in, if you have dependence, mm -hmm. but not all these um, nice properties that we had, right? So, so then, then I don't know what is the right, even information theoretic metric, right? Because our result only works when things are Gaussian and we end up being independent practically because we make all these assumptions, right? On, mm -hmm. on our features. So I, and then in this case, you get the mutual information. So I don't really know what is the correct even. I mean, one, the reason I was partly asking this question was suppose you took your circulant thing and you basically looked at a sequence of systems where you were the, it, it's basically trying to, um, like a discretization that gets to Gaussian. Mm -hmm. And so for every such problem you have, you have your circle and thing, I mean, is there a convergence that you can establish for that measure to the, uh, for, that met, for that particular information measure to the Gaussian? I think that... not, because I think we at some point looked at it and I don't want to say it for sure, but I remember we had issues, so we couldn't show it. Okay. So... Anyway, so let me uh, like, let me I can talk that. more to you about it because I think it's interesting. But but mm -hmm. I recall this was exactly one of the things we considered, and I think we couldn't show it. So anyway, let me not take more time, and then I think you're supposed to meet with Mahdi. And um, so if you guys want, you can meet on the same Zoom. I'll just uh, stop easier, the recording. Yeah, if that's okay. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. I'll so stop much. the recording, and so then it's not a problem. Um, yeah. And thank so you, first I would first I want to thank um, uh, Nigar for an excellent talk. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for attending the talk. Thanks Nigar. Bye. Thank you Lei. Bye bye. So I'm going to stop the recording Mahdi and uh, Al please take over and you can stay as long as you want. Yeah.